Okay, welcome back everyone. It's been a little while. Um, the world has changed since last we met. Who's played around with chat GPT? GPT-4, okay. Who's done something together with an autonomous robot? Who's built a coffee table? Who's fixed a sink? No hands up. That's good. I watched a plumber try to fix, fix a sink. You watched a plumber try to fix a sink. Okay, a, a human plumber or a robot yeah. plumber? Human plumber, okay. So, AI's been solved, robotics, little to no progress. Good news for me, that means I still have a, a job. Good news for all of you, that means there's a good reason to still be taking this class. There is still something to be figured out about intelligence, at least embodied intelligence. So, on we go. Okay, so I'm gonna take a moment to remember where we were, where we are, and where we're going. Um, for the undergraduates, congratulations, you're reaching the end of the beginning. Not quite, but you're almost there. Uh, assignment 10 uh, is your assignment for this week. Uh, I think assignment 10 is the longest and for some people arguably the most challenging, so don't leave it until the last minute. Um, up until now, we've obviously been working with this minimal robot that's got the minimal number of links and joints and sensors and motors so that you can build up an intuition and understand all the moving pieces of your code base. In assignment 10, you're going to be throwing away the minimal robot and swapping in a not so minimal robot, uh, the quadruped. It's a lot of procedural stuff, joint normals, relative coordinates, absolute coordinates. So leave yourself plenty of time to tackle uh, assignment 10. And then obviously next Tuesday, you'll be starting in on your final project. Any questions from the undergraduates about assignments one through 10? So far, so good? Okay, graduate students, you are obviously continuing on uh, with your final project and you are showing us rather than telling us each week how you're taking baby steps towards your final project. Um, I've received a number of questions uh, about sort of how to do that. So I thought I would just take a few moments now to talk about ways to, to divide and conquer, ways to break up your final project uh, and have something interesting to show at the end of the semester. I realize the undergraduates, you're not there yet, but you will be next week. So I think this is a good time to pause and just talk about uh, weekly deliverables um, and what's known as system integration. So building all these components and putting them all uh, together. We've actually talked about one way to do this already in this class, which is scaffolding. What's the canonical example of scaffolding? Training wheels on a bicycle, right? Making things easier for the learner. So scaffold yourself when you're doing your final project. Um, several of you have very challenging uh, final projects. In my opinion, not overly challenging. They, they're doable, but again, you gotta break them down into chunks and, and sort of think creatively about what steps to take uh, to get there. Um, one student was asking about uh, evolving a robot that would walk towards an object and when it comes into contact with that object, walk in the opposite direction, which I think is a great project, something that's doable in this class, um, but obviously not something you're gonna be able to tackle all at once. So how do you break down something like evolve a robot to walk to an object and when it touches the object, detect that it's touching the object and walk in the opposite direction? You know, as just an example, yeah? Simplest thing to do is obviously don't put the object far from the robot. Put the object right next to the robot and send us a weekly deliverable showing that you've added some material to the robot, an arm for example, that it can reach out and tap the object. The robot might not even sense that it's touching the, ro the object yet, but for the TA and I, we get it. Okay, you're eventually gonna put it far away, it's gonna walk, it's gonna tap, come back. Good first weekly deliverable. Next week, show us a video that the robot quote unquote knows that it's touching the object. How might you evolve the robot to demonstrate in a short video that it knows that it's touching the object? Any ideas? End the simulation. Oh, you could end the simulation each time, absolutely, right? We could, you could put an if statement in there, which is your code knows that the, object, the robot has come into contact with the object, that, that's a reasonable milestone, or? So you like print the sensor values for your own? You could print the sensor values, so at least we know that it's sensing that it's in contact with the object. Sure, that would be a fine weekly deliverable. 
other things. How could you get the robot to show us? Both of those examples were showing that the code is registering it or the sensors. Make the robot stop moving when it comes into contact with the object, which is going to require you to change what part of your code base? The brain. The brain, possibly. Let's say we have a touch sensor in this arm, and the touch sensor registers plus one when it touches the block. But how are we going to get the robot to stop moving when that happens? What do we need to change in the code base? The fitness function. So for most of you, um, you're obviously going to be making changes to the robot, like in this example, adding an arm, making changes to the environment, like in this example, adding an external object out there for the robot to come into contact with. Most, if not all of you, are also going to have to change the fitness function. And you might change it every week to evolve the robot to show you and then us that it's doing some simplified version of what eventually you want it to do by the end of this class. Make sense? So if we want the robot to show us that it knows it's in contact with the object by stopping moving, how are you going to change the fitness function? At the moment, most of you have the default fitness function, which is to maximize the Z component or the X component of the robot's body. How do we change the fitness function so when it touches the object, it stops moving? And that's it showing us that it knows it's come into contact with the object. You could basically save the uh, coordinates of whatever part we're going like, to anchor the robot with, probably the main one, um, when it touches the object. And then you can save the difference between the final position and the, phys like, the position when it first touched the object. You could say, I want to minimize that. Okay, perfect. So for those that didn't hear, we, we, you're already recording the 3D position of the, the torso or one part, one uh, link in the robot, which you're using to compute the default fitness function, maximize the z-coordinate. So you have the position of this object all through the simulation. You can compute a different function using those values. You find the point in time in which the touch sensor in the arm becomes positive one, so the moment in time when it comes into contact with the robot. And from that moment onward, for the rest of the simulation, you penalize for movement rather than reward for movement. Yeah? So you can think for yourself now about how you'd actually write this out in code. Um, doesn't matter to us, and we encourage you to be creative with your fitness functions. In this example here, we're, co we're collecting the positions of one or more parts of the robot and computing some function on those positions and returning a single value, which is the fitness, where the higher that value, the more the robot is doing whatever you want it to do. Right? So you can do that. You can use positions of the robot's body um, in the fitness function. You can also put sensor values in there. It can be a function of touch sensor values, or your fitness function can be some combination of a function applied to sensor values and link positions, for example, depending on what you want to do. Make sense? Uh, let's, let's keep playing the fitness function game. Let's say you want to evolve a robot to jump. What's a fitness function that would reward for jumping? Has anyone tried that yet? No? Or I like have the Z value. Maximize the Z value, which is height, right? Has anyone tried that yet? Did it work? Um, not, I mean, it made it like stand up. Ah, higher, I would, but not it, someone does this every year, tries this. Perverse instantiation, thinking about thinking is misleading. You maximize the Z value and you typically get, especially if you're maximizing Z value throughout the simulation, you get this, right? Stand on your tippy toes. Okay, so we've seen this already in several experiments. We've got to make version two of a fitness function. How do you select for jumping and not select for this? The sensor values at the time of the highest recorded Z value. What's that, sorry? So like if the sensor values when you record the highest Z value to see if they're touching the ground or not? To uh, take, find the point in time in which there's the highest Z value and then see whether... Yeah, I guess like just like an equation to see like, you know, comparing how high you are in the air to whether you're touching the ground. 
Okay, so maximize for Z, and at that moment, don't have... for center combat. Okay. You can probably guess where this is going. I would, I would try and act it out, but I'm not a ballet uh, aficionado. A little bit of a hop, maybe. You want jumping, jumping, not toe tapping. You can do two things, um, changes. Um, first, make sure that you have like a really low um, Z value at the beginning. Okay. But then make sure that the um, time between the lowest Z value and the highest high Z value, which is what you want, is the shortest possible. Absolutely. So you can you can add a term to your fitness function that also rewards for lunging or preparation, right? So minimize Z, and then immediately after a word maximize Z. Maybe. Not so easy, right? It seems, hopefully, when we started this line of discussion, it seemed obvious. Jumping, maximize Z, it's easy, right? Not so easy. I will leave it to those, to those of you that are implementing the quadruped this week. See if you can swap out, just for fun, swap out the locomotion fitness function and try rewarding or evolving a robot to jump. It is definitely non-trivial, you know? Okay. So spend some time doing this, and again, once, you, once the undergraduates get into weekly deliverables, think about breaking this down into simpler and simpler pieces, altering the fitness function, maybe you need to uh, alter the robot, the environment, its neural controller. Break it down into small steps, because I can guarantee you whatever you have planned for the final project at the end, it's not that as easy as you might think. Sneak up on it. Any other questions about strategies for final projects? Can we, um, in terms of the weekly deliverables, do they all have to be about the fit around work, or can we kind of be like, well, I have a test that week, so I'm going to dial it back a little bit? Uh, I have a test this week. I have to dial it back. That's not a valid excuse. We're all busy. But if it turns out that one weekly deliverable is a little bit easier than the other, okay. right? What, what we're looking for is that you've put some effort into thinking about how to break this thing down. If you break it down into baby steps, and some baby steps are not as baby step as others, okay. Yeah? Okay. I know we're all busy. We're approaching the end of the term. We're all going to get exponentially more busy. All the more reason to break this down into digestible chunks uh, and tackle one each week. Questions, comments? No? Okay, so uh, let's see. It's been a while since we've uh, discussed evolutionary robotics. We are going to finish, we are going to, uh, sorry, we're not going to finish. We are partway through our uh, theme here on open challenges in the field. Big problems, big challenges to which no one has a good solution yet, which again is good news for us in terms of research and innovation. There's lots of work to do here. So in all the lectures we're looking at in this segment, I am trying my best to introduce you to the problem first and the best solutions that my community has come up with for trying to answer these questions. Just remember, they're all partial answers. No one has found a good answer to these questions yet. It's part of the reason why we don't have a robot fixing our, our sink or loading up our dishwasher, right? It's an open, open, robotics in general is an open problem. And within robotics, there's a thousand open problems to which people don't have good solutions yet. Okay. Uh, so we started in last time in lecture 13 by looking at um, the problem, which is not modularity. The problem is non-modularity. When we evolve uh, robots and their neural controllers, or when we evolve any artifact really, Evolution tends to add stuff and add little pieces and add little bits of duct tape and add pieces here, 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 and makes a more and more densely interconnected machine, which means that as evolution continues, it gets harder and harder for evolution to make changes because any change it, you add to a non-modular system, the effect, the initially local effect of that addition starts to spread through this densely connected machine, and a small change, a small mutation to the machine has a giant effect. If I opened up my laptop and started going in with small instruments and trying to change things, I would immediately break my laptop. It is a very highly optimized and non-modular system, for better or for worse. Yeah? When your cell phone breaks, you have to throw it away. You can't swap in a new piece. 
So can we approach robotics differently? Can we create an evolutionary algorithm that not just evolves a robot to do what we want it to do, but it evolves a modular robot, where the robot is maybe made up of parts, and the robot does things in a modular fashion. Whatever it is we ask the robot to do, it does it by solving a bunch of subproblems. We just spent a few minutes talking about how to try and modularize your final project. Our tendency in the tendency of machines, the tendency of evolution, is to sort of tackle things head on and everything gets snarled up. How do you approach a problem and solve it in modules and then put these modules together? That's what we were looking at last time. So let's conclude our lecture on modularity. Okay. We've looked at, we've already looked at modularity uh, a few times in this course already. Some of you might remember the small humanoid that would shake the block up and down, left and right, forward and back. It solved that problem using functional modularity. We had these very slow neurons in the CTRNN, the Eeyore neurons, with a large tau value that changed their value slowly. Those slow neurons were influencing fast neurons and would, in effect, push this connection of fast neurons into different repeating patterns. That was functional modularity. We uh, ended last time by starting to look at behavioral modularity. Evolving a robot that solves a bunch of sub-behaviors and then puts those behaviors together into whatever it is we actually want it to do. So just to remind you, uh, we've, got, we've gone back to our little Kepra here, this little hockey puck sized uh, robot with two wheels. It's got infrared sensors so it can see distance in front of itself. And it also has uh, this little uh, this little gripper on the front, and it's going to drive around inside this arena. Inside this arena are five wooden pegs. And the robot's task is to go find one of these pegs, grab it, lift it, drive to the edge of, an arena, of the arena, and throw it outside the arena. So we've got our Kepra robot. We've got seven sensors, six infrared sensors, which report distance at every time step, and one light barrier sensor. So in between the two pincers that make up the robot's gripper, there's a little laser, and when it, uh, when it comes into contact, or when it uh, comes into contact with a, wooden, uh, with a wooden peg, that laser beam is broken, and that triggers the robot to know that there's something between its two pincers. Yeah. There are four motor neurons. The first two are kind of familiar. The first one will spin the left motor, uh, will spin the left wheel forward or back. Second motor neuron, its value will spin the right, mo uh, right wheel forward or back. The third and fourth motor neurons actually trigger a motor primitive, a simple sort of action. The third motor neuron triggers ob uh, object pickup, and the fourth motor neuron triggers object release. Remember that we're, we're talking about four motor neurons, so at every time step in the simulation, and also in reality, we're gonna see this run on the physical Kepra, at every time step, we have these four floating point values arriving at these four motor neurons. The, two, the first two floating point values control the two wheels. The third floating point value, if it's above a certain threshold, it shuts off the other three motor neurons and causes the robot to do this. If the fourth motor neuron's value is above some threshold, it also shuts off everything else and causes the robot to stop what it's doing and do this. We've also seen this idea before where something happens uh, for the robot and it shuts off everything else and does this thing. Where have we seen this before? Roomba. Sorry? The Roomba. The Roomba, absolutely, right? The Roomba's cleaning your second floor and it gets to the top of the stairs and there's a sensor that's looking down. The, sudden that, the, su the moment that sensor is unobstructed, meaning the Roomba has gone off the, ed the edge of the top of your stairs, 
the Roomba stops everything else it's doing, turns, and drives in the other direction. This is the subsumption architecture. There is a certain urgency or there's some sort of event that subsumes or takes over everything else that the robot is doing. Yeah. So far so good? Okay. Okay, so I think, if I remember correctly, before spring break I left you with this question. We know what the robot needs to do overall. How do we modularize this problem? How do we break this down into a number of subtasks and evolve the robot to do all these subtasks? And if it evolves to do all these subtasks, it also then, by definition, does the overall task. Yeah? It's obvious how to modularize this task, right? There, go around, move around, avoid the walls, look for, look for, uh, look for a peg. Yeah? Makes sense, it's kind of module one. Once you find a peg, we'll have a second module or a, little, a second motor primitive or a second little behavior, which is move to the peg, center it between your pincers and pick it up. Next module, go find the closest wall, drive to it, and the last module, throw it over the wall. Obvious, right? You all know me by now. Yeah. OK. What we're going to look at in this experiment is several, we're going to actually look at several experiments. One in which the robot is not allowed to break the task down into modules. Let's just see how it does at the overall task. Next experiment we're going to look at is we, as brilliant humans, are going to come in and tell the robot and the evolutionary algorithm how to divide and conquer. The last experiment we're going to see, we are going to be humble. We are not going to assume that we know how to break down the task for the machine. We're going to let the evolutionary algorithm break down the task for the machine. Yeah? OK. All right, so how are we going to do this? They're going to do this by, uh, by actually not creating different fitness functions. They're going to create different brains for the robot. Yeah? Let's start with brain A. Here's our seven sensor neurons that we just mentioned and our four motor neurons that we just mentioned. This is the simplest neural controller you can imagine. We're going to connect every sensor to every motor with the synapse, which gives us 7 times 4, 28 total synapses. No hidden neurons, no recurrent connections, no modules, no nothing. Evolve this set of 28 synaptic weights to get the robot to drive, grab the pegs, find a wall, and throw as many pegs out of the arena as possible in a fixed period of time. Kind of the simplest thing you can do. Yeah. OK. That's experiment A. Experiment B, they're going, to evolve, uh, they're going to evolve controller Bs, where the seven sensor neurons and the four motor neurons, same as before. So nothing else is changing about the experiment. But we're going to give the robot a little bit more neural real estate. We're going to give it four uh, hidden neurons, wire up all the sensor neurons to all the hidden neurons, and then all the hidden neurons to all the motor neurons. And then ask whether it's easier for the evolutionary algorithm to evolve the robot to clean the arena with brain B, or to clean the, evolve to clean the arena with brain A. Why might the robot equipped with brain B have a, a better chance? Recall our discussion about neural networks. What is it about hidden layers, hidden neurons that might help? It allows for more complex behavior. It allows for more complex behavior in what way? What, what kinds of complex behaviors? What, what is possible like for B that's not possible for A? Like having like a nonlinear kind of. A nonlinear, a nonlinear transformation from sensor values to motor neurons. Way back when we talked about neural networks, we saw that there were certain transformations that these networks cannot learn. We were looking at the exclusive OR in that case, which is a nonlinear function. Yeah? So maybe cleaning pegs out of an arena requires the robot at least some of the time to transform what it senses into what it does in a nonlinear way. For example, the more sensation you get, 
the less action you should do. That's a nonlinear transformation, right? As a simple example. Okay. Brain B, this, they've sort of drawn this in an odd way, so bear with me here. Uh, in, or sorry, in brain C, we've got our seven sensor neurons as in B. We also have one, two, three, four hidden neurons as we do in brain B. And in this case, they've wired up all the, se the seven sensors to the first two hidden neurons. And they've got recurrent connections going to the third and the fourth hidden neuron. And then synapses going from the third and the fourth hidden neuron out to the motors. It's kind of an odd way to add recurrent connections into the hidden layer. I don't know why they did it in this non-standard way. But for our purposes, they're basically just add, they, they're adding stuff. So in B, they added in hidden neurons. In C, they're adding in recurrent connections. Why might recurrent connections help? What do recurrent connections do for the robot? Anybody remember? There's your hint. Memory, right? So maybe it's helpful for the robot to remember in this task. It's not so obvious that memory actually is useful here. OK. In brain D, this is the brilliant investigators going in and knowing how to, they're going to tell, they are telling the robot how to divide and conquer in this case. They're doing it, again, by altering the robot's uh, brain. You'll notice we've got our seven sensor neurons here, but we now have two neural modules in brain D. This module, A, uh, lowercase a, and this module here, lowercase b. Yeah? In brain D, when uh, the gripper is empty, when that uh, laser beam between the pincers is not broken, meaning the robot is not carrying or about to grab uh, a peg, these sensor weights transform sensor values, or sorry, these synaptic weights transform these sensor values into motors. So it uses this neural module when it's not holding a peg. And the moment that light beam is broken, assuming it's going to try and grab it and carry it and throw it away, this neural module takes over. So it's actually not that different from our brains. We've got two hemispheres here. But in this case, neither, uh, one hemisphere is in control at any one time. Which reminds me, actually, this is not so much like a human brain, but a dolphin brain. So dolphins also have a bicameral brain. They have two parts to their brain. One half is always asleep. Yeah? OK. Completely irrelevant for today's discussion, but I always thought that was cool. OK. So these two modules. So the investigators, in their in infinite wisdom, have decided that probably it's good for the robot to be doing one thing whatever that thing is, and we'll let evolution figure that out by tuning these weights to do one thing when it's looking for pegs and to be doing something else when it has a peg. Make sense? So it's not, a, it's not this way of decomposing the task. There's many obvious or intuitive ways we might come up with for decomposing the task. They're just decomposing it into two parts. Look for pegs, get rid of pegs. So far, so good? OK. Fifth and final experiment is experiment E. This one takes a little bit to wrap your mind around, so I'll, I'll take my time. Please stop me and ask questions if something is unclear. This is the investigator's attempt to allow evolution to carve up the robot's brain into different kinds of modules, depending on where evolution thinks it makes sense to carve up this overall task. Yeah? OK, how did they enable the evolutionary algorithm to do this? Let's start with the seven sensor neurons. They're there, as usual, no change. You'll notice at the motor layer, we now have four groups of four uh, output neurons. In each of the four groups, there are two selector neurons in black and two output or motor neurons in white. Yeah. 
So we have seven sensors down here and 16 output neurons down here. So there's a total of seven times 16 synaptic weights that evolution is going to be tuning when we evolve robots with brain E to clean the arena. So far, so good? Okay. You can see up here that these four groups correspond to these four basic actions that the robot can perform. This set of four neurons collectively is going to control the left motor or spin the left wheel. This set of four neurons together is going to collectively control the right wheel. This set of four is going to control whether or not the pickup motor primitive is triggered. This final set of four neurons is going to control whether or not the release motor primitive is triggered. Yeah. OK, so imagine that we have some arbitrary set of synaptic weights. We drop those synaptic weights into the robot, and the robot starts moving about in the arena. Imagine at a given point in time, we freeze everything, and we look at all of the values at all 16 output neurons. Let's look at the, four, the first four neurons first. Let's look at the selector neurons. Remember that at all of these neurons, there's a floating point value that's arriving there. If the value of the left selector neuron is greater than the value of the right selector neuron, then the value of the left output neuron grabs control of the left wheel. If, alternatively, the value of the right selector neuron is greater than the value of the left selector neuron, then this, the value of this output neuron, controls the left motor. So these selector neurons, the values arriving at them, are controlling which one of these two sort of competitors is allowed to control the left wheel. Make sense so far? OK. Seems kind of an arbitrary and odd thing to do. Imagine that this decomposition does kind of make sense. And there should be something that the robot does when it's not holding the peg. And then there's something else different it should be doing when it's actually uh, holding a peg. So imagine that all these synaptic weights evolve so that when the robot is not holding a peg, all the left selector neuron values are higher than all the right selector neuron values. That would mean that this motor neuron, this motor neuron, this motor neuron, and this motor neuron are controlling the beha behavior of the robot while it doesn't have a peg. The moment that light barrier sensor is broken and it's in the presence of a peg, imagine that based on all these synaptic weights, suddenly all the right selector neurons have greater values than the left selector neurons, which means suddenly the brain shifts and suddenly all of these modules are in control of the robot's behavior. All of the right hand output neurons are in control. Yeah. Imagine that the left hemisphere of your brain is useful for when you are not in the presence of pegs, and your right hemisphere is useful when you're in the presence of pegs, and there is some other part of your brain that is in neither hemisphere that decides which hemisphere should be in control. We don't, we don't have a peg, so left hemisphere, you get to control all the muscles in the body. Oh, wait a second, now we're holding a peg, so right hemisphere, you take over, and now you're allowed to control the uh, body. Make sense? Okay, last twist on all of this is remember that all of these synapses, all these synaptic weights are evolving. So the simple example which I just described to you, which is all the left modules are in control when, the, when no peg, and then suddenly all the right modules are in control when it's grabbing a peg. That's one possible solution. Another solution might be left module and right, right, right module are in control when you're near a wall. And right 
left, left, left module is in control when you're not near a wall. Maybe that's actually a better way for evolution to compose the task, given the robot and the task and so on. Or maybe it's something else entirely. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so here's all the five experiments. We're going to look at data on the next slide where they evolved the robot with each of these five brains many times and asked the following question. Asked the first question is, do any of these brains make it easier to evolve the robot to do the task? What, you know, what, if anything, helps here? So if B, does, if B, C, D, and E do better than A, that means internal units, internal units are hidden neurons, they all mean the same thing. Hidden neurons are helpful for this task. If C, uh, if C does better than the other four, that means recurrent connections, memory is helpful. If D and or E do better than A, B, C, that means that modularity, either imposed by humans or imposed by the evolutionary algorithm is helpful. If only if E is better than A, B, C, or D, that means humans aren't very bright. We don't know how to carve up a task for this robot. We need to turn over not just the evolution of behavior, but the evolution of modularity to the evolutionary algorithm. Questions? Is it possible to um, evolve the neural network function in that way where the actual physical structure of it has evolved over time and that wouldn't really? Uh, yes, absolutely. So the last module of the class, we're going to look at several experiments where body is evolved along with the brain. What is a modular body plan? Right? We, here, we're looking at here we're looking at modular neural networks and non-modular neural networks can ask the same questions about bodies. The human body is relatively modular. I can manipulate things up here at the front of the room and I'm actually changing my overall mass distribution, but I don't fall over. There's a little bit of an impact on the pressure uh, sense organs in my feet when I pick up my cell phone, but not much. We're pretty modular. Not perfectly, but you can also ask these questions about the body. Yeah? I think they were asking you, and if not, then I'm asking, um, about if you can evolve the um, architecture of the neural network uh, instead of like, the body. Uh, evolve the architecture of the neural network. Yes, you can also do that. So we're going to look at also look at some experiments later in the course where mutation operators can add and remove neurons and synapses. Yeah? So here, obviously, they're imposing it, and we're still looking at experiments where we're, we're fixing the cognitive architecture. No addition or subtraction of neurons and synapses here. But yes, absolutely. We can allow evolution to tinker with that as well. Other questions? So far, so good? OK, any bets? Obviously, we're talking about this experiment, so some, something here must have been better than something else. Hopefully, you have all cultivated enough humility at this point to know that it's not going to be D or B uh, or A, for that matter, or B. E blew the other four neural networks out of the water. So we're looking, hopefully, at what is now a familiar visualization. On the horizontal axis here, we have evolutionary time. We have generations passing in which populations of controllers A or B or C or D or E are evolving. And the vertical axis is showing fitness here, how well the robot does at cleaning up the arena. We haven't talked about the fitness function yet. They have kind of a my opinion, a bit of a clunky way of defining fitness here. For each controller, for each neural network controller, uh, they dropped that controller into the robot and then put the robot into the arena 15 times at different positions and orientations. 
So they dropped it in at this position in this orientation, took it out, put it over here, put it facing the wall, and so on. And so they're sort of evaluating each controller 15 times. And they, uh, they refer to these as epochs. And they counted either uh, success or failure. So if 2,000 actions, you can think of these as basically time steps. If 2,000 actions elapsed during one of these epochs and the robot did not dump uh, a peg out of the arena, that was a failure. They stopped the robot, picked it up, put it at a different position and orientation, zero. If uh, the robot, within those, that within those 200 time steps, if it found an object, took it to a wall, and successfully released it beyond the wall out of the arena, that was a success. Yeah? So this is a fitness function that's actually an integer fitness function that can range between 0 and 15. It's successful. How many out of, out of these 15 times is it successful? Uh, it's, there, you'll notice there's five pegs here, and some of these controllers evolved to clean out more than one peg. Uh, it, this wasn't described in the paper. I think what they did is they brought some of the pegs back if the robot had taken them outside of the arena. It's a little confusing, but it doesn't matter too much for our purposes. Okay, so you'll notice that e, uh, the E controllers evolved to enable the robot to clean up the arena much better, much quickly, much more quickly. Some of these controllers eventually, with much more evolutionary time, started to catch up, and poor A never really caught up at all. So A clearly did worse than the other four, which tells us what? The simplest brain isn't going to cut it, and at least for this task, you need you need hidden neurons, which allow nonlinear transformations from what you sense into what you do. Now, what nonlinear transformations were helpful here? Who knows? Yeah. The important thing here for for us is that E did much better than D, which means the investigators' guess, and maybe what would have been my guess as well, about an obvious way to scaffold this robot, to make things easier on the robot, was wrong. Yeah? This is an important lesson that we are still learning in robotics and AI in general. Right? Really hard to teach a machine to do something. It's also very hard to try and tell the machine how to break it up to eventually learn the overall task. Better to figure out how to allow the machine to teach itself or evolve the ability to break down the task itself. Yeah? I am going to skip over this plot here. It's basically just reporting the same thing. E is really good. The other four are bad. OK, so <laughs> the last thing we're going to tackle in this lecture, and this is the most difficult part, so bear with me, what modularity evolved in these E brains? These E brains did better, so this means modularity is useful for this task, but not the kind of modularity we thought. So what? What modularity evolved here? Okay. So we can ask a number of questions. The first question we can ask is, is there a correspondence between the evolved modules? So remember these selector modules are like allowing different parts of the brain to control what the robot does. And we can watch the, when these modules switch. And we can then watch what the robot is doing and see is there a correspondence between this module and looking for pegs, or this module and near the, the wall, or this module and spin counterclockwise. I don't know. Is there any correspondence between what the robot is doing and which part of the brain is in control at that time? The answer is no. Whatever's going on, much more complicated than that. OK, so we're going to look on the next slide at we're going to try and analyze this as best we can. We're going to look at this for only one evolved brain, one set of synaptic weights. This particular set of synaptic weights allowed the robot to do a fantastic job of cleaning up the arena. We'll see how well it does in a moment. This controller has only two states. So there are only, again, continuing this metaphor, there are only two hemispheres here. 
only the right motor, this group here, the second set of four neurons, only in this case does the selector neuron switch between this module and this module. In these other three groups, either the left or the right selector neuron's value is always greater than the other selector neuron's value. There's no switching among this set of modules, there's no switching among this set of modules, and there's no switching among this set of modules. It's only seeming to use modularity for the right motor. Seems like kind of an odd situation. Everybody with me? These synaptic weights could have evolved, so there was a lot more switching going on. It could have used many more modules at different times or in different situations from the robot's perspective. Evolution said, I, I don't need it. For some reason, it only needed it. It only needed modules for controlling what the right wheel did. Seem already moving into very non-intuitive territory here. Yeah? Okay. All right, deep breath, here we go. Let's start in the upper, uh, the upper left here. This shows what the robot actually did. This is an older experiment, pre-YouTube era, so again, my apologies, no video here. We're gonna have to run the YouTube in your head and animate this as I describe it. If you look very carefully, you'll notice the line, there's a line segment, this trajectory starts here. This is the robot driving, driving, driving. Uh, it grabs this module, it grabs this peg, drives down here, faces the wall, drops the peg outside of the arena. The robot is sitting here, dropping it over the southern wall of the arena. Then the robot turns around, drives north, comes into contact with this peg, stops, picks it up, drives over here, drops it beyond the north wall turns around and somehow grabs, oh yeah, grabs this one, comes down here, finds the west wall, drops this third peg over the west wall, starts driving northeast again, and the simulation ended. Presumably if we let the simulation keep going, it would drive around and eventually find and clear out the fourth and the fifth peg. Yeah? Okay. That's what the robot did. Let's dive into the brain of the robot and see what's going on. Let's look at this top row here. Um, all of the columns here, so the horizontal axis in this plot, they, they call this life cycles. These are time steps. So we're not looking at evolutionary time now. We're looking at all the time steps in the simulation while this was happening. Yeah? Okay. Mod stands for module. And a black mark means in the right motor module, the right selector neuron's value was greater than the left selector neuron's value. The right hemisphere, this module, was in charge wherever, at every point in time that there's a black mark here. Wherever there's white, at that point in time, the left hemisphere was in charge of the right motor. So, we can see the robot as it's moving, switching in its mind, switching back and forth between which parts of its mind was in control, not of its entire behavior, but just in control of the right motor. So far, so good? Everybody confused? Good, okay, it's meant to be confusing. Gets even more confusing. You'll notice that there aren't a lot of contiguous bands of black. We sort of, sort of see these stitches, these spikes of black. So this is not like the dolphin where one hemisphere is asleep for 12 hours and then awake for 12 hours asleep. It's rapid switching back and forth, which is again sort of doesn't really make sense to us in terms of modules. It's easier for us dumb humans to think about one module, it's in charge for a while, it does whatever it's supposed to do, and then the situation changes, and now this module is in control and takes over and does what it needs to do. This rapid switching between different behaviors kind of doesn't really make sense. Yeah? The Roomba's cleaning up, cleaning up, oh, 
comes into con, it's about to go fall, tumble down the stairs, pause for a few seconds, turn, drive away, now go back to cleaning up the floor, right? Makes sense for there to be these contiguous periods of time in which different behaviors are in charge of the machine. Evolution has no, does not have this mental limitation. Evolution apparently seems perfectly happy to make things modular and then use different modules very rapidly uh, in succession. So far, so good? Okay. Given that, can we still, can we try and see any correspondence between which part of the brain is in control and what the robot is doing? Uh, you'll notice the next row here, uh, this is all kind of cryptic. Uh, WT is what is perceived. So is the robot, are the infrared sensors uh, hitting a wall or are the infrared sensors hitting a target object, one of the pegs? Remember, this robot has seven infrared sensors, so it's possible for the infrared sensors to be hitting the wall and hitting a peg simultaneously. In this case, they're just reporting which is closer, the wall or the target object, uh, or neither. So you'll notice an upper black bar here. This is when the robot is per perceiving uh, a target. So the, the robot started here. Remember the robot started here. It was facing southeast. So it was seeing this peg or this target object. That's what this first black band represents. The robot moves, picks up, I'm sorry, it's looking at this, uh, this peg down here, sees this peg, grabs it. And now down here, the robot is seeing the wall. And then here where it's white, the robot has turned around and it's not really seeing any pegs or a wall, or at least those objects are very far away. So they're sort of showing what the robot is looking at. Do these modules correspond to what the robot is looking at? Is one module in control when it's looking at the wall and the other module is in control when it's looking at the target object? Nope, right? Black up here does not correspond with black down here. Okay, our first easy win, gone. Next, here's what the left, here's the left motor and here's the right motor. So uh, rows three and four here are showing what the wheels are doing. Uh, you might be able to guess already, black here is the wheel spinning quickly and then these stitches or patches of white is the wheel slowing down and in some cases, where there's complete white here, this is the wheel stopping altogether. Any correspondence between the two behaviors and what the wheels are doing? Some. Correspondence between the modules and what the right wheel is doing, which is actually kind of what we expect because evolution evolved two different hemispheres to control the right wheel. Okay. So that at least makes sense, but what, what exactly does that mean, right? We're looking for correspondence between modules and behaviors. How about pickup behavior? Here's the robot picking up uh, object, uh, here's the robot picking up object one, and the release behavior in, is inhibited during this period. This is the robot carrying the first peg, and at this moment here, the release uh, behavior is no longer inhibited and is triggered, and the robot is doing this and throwing the first peg out of the arena, driving around, driving around, grabs the second peg, is carrying the second peg, drops the second peg outside of the arena, looking, 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 grabs the third peg, drives to the west wall, and drops the third peg over the west wall. Any correspondence between the pickup and release behavior and the modules? A little bit? So some, a little bit, somehow. Here are the values of the, uh, oh sorry, there were six infrared sensors plus the light barrier sensor. So here's the seven sensors. Any correspondence between the modules and the sensors? What's the correspondence here? Seems that like sensors two through four have a pretty good, you know, fairly large impact on what modules they use. 
So two, three, I, uh, infrared sensor two, three, and four seem to correspond with the modules. And remember that the sensors are influencing, the, val the sensor values are influencing the selector neurons. So it's some, something about I234 that is telling uh, the motor is telling the brain to switch between these different hemispheres. Why that's helpful for the behavior, who knows? Yeah. A, B, A through H here. This was the investigators' last hope. They they came up. They had their own different kinds of ways of thinking about decomposing the task. It's carrying the object, looking for the wall, or it's looking for an, it's the gripper's empty, looking for a wall. Here's all the behaviors that are observed in here that could be useful sub-behaviors. Do any of these investigator-formulated mo behavioral modules correspond with the evolved module, or evolved modules? I've looked at this plot hundreds of times. I've tried to convince myself that there's some correspondence here. I don't, I don't think so. The way that we think about carving up tasks, at least in this example, is very different from the way that evolution thinks about carving up tasks. OK. How are we doing for time? Uh, let's see. I'm going to skip I'm going to skip this plot. I will we'll end this lecture by looking at this one. This is similar to some of the plots we saw when we, in the minimal cognition experiments. Let's see how that one evolved E controller that we just analyzed, how does it do when we allow it to control the robot in situations that the robot never experienced during evolution? Yeah. They're going to take they're going to take the robot with the E controller, and they're going to put it in the arena thousands of times at different positions and at different initial orientations. So every pixel in this 2D panel corresponds to a particular drop of the robot into the arena. Let's go to 0, 0, which is down here. So the horizontal axis here shows um, how, the, uh, how the robot is oriented. So zero is it's facing onward, and uh, uh, 90 degrees and 270 is it's facing to the left or facing to the right, the wall. The horizontal axis down here, zero says the robot is facing a cylinder, 45 degrees, the robot has a cylinder uh, uh, in front and to the right of it, 90 degrees, there's a cylinder to the right of the robot, 270 degrees, there's a cylinder right off to the left of the robot, and so on. The vertical axis is how far away either the wall or the cylinder is from the robot. So the pixel at 0, 0, this means the robot is facing the wall directly, x equals 0, and it's placed directly in front of the wall, y equals 0. The pixel up here at 0, 45, the robot is facing the wall, but it is 45 length units away from the wall, whatever length units are here. It's far from the wall. Make sense? So far, so good? OK. They did the same thing again. They placed the robot in a whole bunch of different initial positions and orientations relative to a wall, but they started the robot with holding they started the robot uh, where it was holding a cylinder. It was holding, yeah, it was holding a cylinder, holding one of the pegs. Yeah? So what should the robot do when it's facing the wall? The wall is right in front of it, and it's holding, and it's holding a cylinder. Drop it. Drop it, yeah? So a white pixel shows that it did, uh, a white pixel uh, indicates that neither of the behaviors were triggered. Uh, sorry, neither of the pickup or release behaviors were triggered. So in this case, the robot is directly facing the wall. Uh, it's right in front of the wall. It's got a cylinder, and it doesn't drop it, actually. So it's not actually doing the right thing in this case. Yeah. 
Some other cases shown in gray here, these are all cases where the robot is more or less facing the wall and it's pretty close to the wall and gray triggers the release behavior. So all of these gray pixels here, this is the robot doing the right thing. When given the peg, placed in front of the wall, facing the wall, most of the time it drops the peg, but not all of the time. So far so good? Okay. Over here, when we put it near a wall or away from a wall, the gripper is empty all of the time. It neither attempts to pick up nor attempts to drop. Okay, that seems reasonable. Yeah. Down here, we're going to place the robot near a gripper, uh, near a cylinder and facing a cylinder, and it's not holding a cylinder. In these cases, in several cases here shown in black, it triggers the pickup behavior, also doing the right thing. Yeah. Here, we place the robot near a cylinder, facing a cylinder, but it's already holding a cylinder. It does the right thing, which is nothing. Yeah, don't drop what you already have. Yeah, okay. Uh, same thing down. Uh, same thing down here. This is another uh, evolved e controller that does pretty well, but it makes a few mistakes. This particular evolved e controller down here. It's placed face more or less facing a cylinder, close to a cylinder, and it's already holding a cylinder. You see some gray, which means. It drops the cylinder it's already holding and presumably tries to go grab the other one or grab the one it just dropped. Not perfect. I want you to keep your eye on this part of the screen. This is where it's making a mistake. These plots here, every black pixel here corresponds to a familiar situation. This is a situ situation that this e-controller saw during evolution. Question in the back? I was I just literally didn't see which graph we were supposed to be. Oh, looking at. this this one down here. Yep. So all the black pixels here. So for example, this black pixel says, yeah, the robot was facing a hundred degrees relative to a cylinder, and it was about 20 units away from the cylinder. The E controller has seen that situation during evolution. What the robot did in that situation, this graph does not show that. White pixels, these are situations the E controller never saw during evolution. Why is the E controller, sorry, why is the E controller making mistakes here? It's never been in that situation. It's never been in that situation before, right? This is what keeps OpenAI and Uber and all, all the rest of them away, uh, Tesla. All, all the AI developers awake at night. We are starting to deploy machines into the real world, and if you played around with ChatGPT, whatever you said to ChatGPT, it's probably not something it's ever heard before. There's someone at OpenAI keeping their fingers crosses, crossed, hoping that ChatGPT does kind of the right thing, that it doesn't do this, yeah? Okay. Okay, so to summarize, there's a lot in this experiment. This experiment demonstrated at least four different things. Evolution, by tuning the weights of controller E, uh, evolution was able to influence which sensor states would be experienced during moving, right? What the robot experiences and what it doesn't experience is dictated by how the robot behaves in its environment, which is dictated in this case by the synaptic weights in the controller. Yeah. Evolution, when it's evolving controller E, is also free to decide whether or not to include modularity. Maybe for certain tasks, modularity doesn't make sense. It feels like for us poor humans, modularity always makes sense because it's hard for us to think about solutions to hard problems. It's easier for us to think about breaking those problems up into baby steps, into modules. But maybe that's just our limitation. Maybe that nature isn't like that. Maybe not every problem needs a modular solution. So 
Evolution can, can choose never to switch between selector neurons. It doesn't necessarily need to switch between the different hemispheres or the different neural modules that exist inside of controller E. Everybody see that? Okay. Third thing, if modularity is useful, evolution is free to decide which situations trigger the switching out of one module and the switching in of another one. Whatever those situations are, at least in the experiment we just saw, they don't make sense to us. Like, I have a peg or I don't have a peg. And finally, what do these actual modules or these hemispheres should do? What do they cause the robot to do? That is also up to evolution and not up to us. All good? Okay, we're gonna switch now from modularity. We're gonna switch now from modularity to the next open problem in the field to which the solution, there are two, uh, there are two algorithms that are the solutions to this problem, neat and hyper neat. I haven't told you what the problem is. I think I will have time to do so over the next nine minutes. The problem we're going to look at here is known as the competing conventions problem. For those of you that have got to the parallel hill climber and the genetic algorithm, you're evolving populations of neural networks. Those neural networks hopefully are allowing your robot to do kind of a good job at whatever it is you want the robot to do, but maybe not perfectly. Your neural networks may have parts inside, not quite modules in the way we just saw, but different parts inside the neural network that are allowing it to do some things well and other things not so well. I want you to remember back to our discussion of neural networks where we were looking at neural networks that were solving logical, uh, logic, Boolean logic uh, operations, and, or, exclusive or. We looked at the XOR case where we created a neural network with hidden neurons where one hidden neuron computes AND, the second hidden neuron computes OR, and then there are synaptic weights that combine the results from those two hidden neurons to produce exclusive OR. Yeah. Imagine a hypothetical function, not exclusive OR anymore, that requires three parts not AND and OR anymore, but it requires parts A, B, and C. And it needs to be able to compute those subfunctions A, B, and C, and then combine those subfunctions A, B, and C at their output layer for whatever it is we want this, neuro this neural network to do. Yeah? Okay. These, imagine that these are two neural networks that we're taking out of an evolving population. This is partway through the evolutionary process. And let's imagine that this one over here is actually doing a pretty good job at computing A and B, but not doing such a good job at computing C. It's two thirds of the way there. The fitness function is awarding this neural network a score that's kind of two thirds, two thirds of the way there. Imagine this neural network, which is in the same evolving population, is actually doing a pretty bad job at C and B, but doing a pretty good job at A. Wouldn't it be nice if there were a way to take A and B from this network, because it's doing pretty good at A and B, and take C from this network, where it's doing a pretty good job at C, put those together to produce a child neural network that is doing a pretty good job now at A, B, and C. We'd like to create a child which inherits the best from both parents and leaves what both parents are not so good at behind. Mother Nature solved this problem quite a while ago. How did she solve it? Think back to high school biology here. I describe Mother Nature as she. It's the reason why we have pronouns. No? 
sexual recombination, the diploid genome combining material from both parents, alleles, hopefully some, some recognition. Okay, right? Sex was evolved in order, because no organism is perfect, and every organism is better at some things and worse at other things than other organisms. Given that situation, no one's perfect, everyone is better or worse at some things, that means there's always a good chance, or there's always a chance, that if you're plucking genetic material from different parents or different contributors, even if you're doing it at random, some of the time you'll be able to grab good genetic material and put it together in a new organism, or as we'll see in a moment, in a machine, that inherits the best of both worlds, the best from both parents, or all three parents, or all 10 parents. On this planet, it's usually two parents, yeah? Okay, so how do we do that? I want you to look at these two neural networks. The way this is done in nature, of course, is with, uh, with genomes, they are cut, and then they are combined together in certain ways. I want, to I want you to imagine that I give you a knife, and you need to cut these two networks somewhere, take those two cut parts and glue them together so that you get this good stuff, o only this good stuff, and only this, sorry, only this good stuff from the second neural network. Where are you gonna cut them? So makes sense for this one to cut here, and we're gonna take everything on the left side of this cut. Everything on the left is the good, the good side, yeah? But then we're, we cut over here in the same place, and now we have A on one side, and we have C, B on the other side. C is the thing we want, but we don't want B. We already have good B from parent one, so that's no good. We cut here, but then how do we glue this together? It's not so, there is no good way to cut these two pieces. Yeah? Part of the reason why we can't do this is because of what's known as the competing conventions problem. I told you already that in this hypothetical situation, it's, you, these networks have to solve A, B, and C at their three hidden neurons. But no one said that A has to be solved by hidden neuron one, and B at hidden neuron two, and C at hidden neuron three. Yeah? If you remember back when we looked at the neural network, network with exclusive or, I don't even remember now, I think I had and on the left side and or on the right side in the hidden layer. It doesn't have to be like that. It could have been or on the left and and on the right. You could imagine inside a population of evolving neural networks, they evolve competing conventions. This neural network and its offspring and its offspring's offspring tries to compute C at hidden neuron one, but this neural network and its offspring and its offspring's offspring compute C at hidden neuron three. They're getting better at solving the subfunctions, but they're doing it at different places in their brain so if we try and cut pieces out and glue them together, it's not going to work, right? If I have my, uh, my Mac and if I had a PC and I cut them in half and tried to glue them together, obviously it wouldn't work very well, but I'd also probably end up with you know, two CPUs or two hard drives because in, on one platform, there's one convention, which is hard drive on the left, CPU on the right. The other platform, CPU on the left, hard drive on the right. So even if I could, I'd have to figure out how to cut so I only bring one part from each machine. Not so obvious to see how to do that. So this cartoon example down here, ABC, CBA. In this example, I was saying, let's cut here, which means I get in one child, I get AB from parent one. But if I'm cutting here and I cut here as well, I get a second A from parent one. So child one has two copies of A, has no C. It's going to do terribly. Second child, I've cut here. So it gets the second child gets C from parent one. 
put it here, and it gets BC from parent two, put it here, it lost A, it's got two copies of C, one's a good C, one's a bad C, both children are in trouble. I'll leave you with this problem, and we'll see the solution on Thursday. Have a good day. You're working on a quiz, assignment 10, and weekly deliverable 4. See you on Thursday.